the red flag flying here. Hello and welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today I am here with Austin Harney. Hello, Austin. Uh, hello there, Paul. How are you? I'm absolutely fine, thanks, and I hope you are too. Now I'm going to go straight into the uh, into the big question, which is, uh, what is socialism to you? Um, a very important topic um, to us. Well, not just an important topic, but a very important belief to me personally as well. Um, I think what is the importance of socialism I mean, I don't need to go into detail that I'd studied at school or whatever. I'm not going to go into the intellectual side of socialism. I'm going to talk more about the practicalities of what we face in everyday life. And the importance of socialism to me is about a fairer society, uh, a society where we feel more equal to each other, where we don't feel divided by divisions and class divisions in society itself. Also, the fact is um, the ability to, you know, be rewarded for hard work, to be treated with dignity, to be treated with equality, but also not to be exploited by anybody as well, to be protected from exploitation at all times. And I think that's important. Well, every um, company in this, in this country and throughout the world, every employer must be unionized. Workers must have a say. Management and the employers, well, they're only 8% of the workforce. It's the work, the unions are the majority. They are the voice of the workers. And especially for socialism and in, in everyday life, and how and an affordable living and the right to retire on a decent pension. I think those are important issues for all of us. Um, me personally, why did I get become more involved in socialism? Well, first of all, I grew up as one of the fascist children, but sadly I was diagnosed with autism, and that really impacted on my ability to learn. That also impacted on my ability to seek a job. And unfortunately, in the in fascist era, particularly in London. Autistic people like myself were very vulnerable. They still are today. Only 16% have full-time employment and a further 9% have part-time jobs. But it was terrible in Thatcher's era, um, the way autistic people treated. And there were no reasonable adjustments in those days. Uh, I was about to be sacked from my job in the civil service. Um, nobody was prepared to help me. Managers tried, said they would, but that was just false promises. Uh, the welfare uh, did not give me any support, neither the occupation health was appalling, the report. They said my autism was uh, recoverable or that I could recover. And if I couldn't do the job, then I didn't have the intelligence. So that was what I was up against at work. But it was union reps that stuck their necks out for me. Union reps that saved my job. Union reps that were dis despised by many managers and labeled as hard left reps, which is interesting. And these so-called hard left reps were close friends, old friends of Mark Sawatka, our current general secretary today. So the, the fact that these people stuck their necks out for me, they actually saved my job. They were the only people who gave me hope in employment, a chance to deliver, a chance of what I could set out to do because I was up against a prejudiced society. And that is what socialism actually did. It saved me. And I think it's important to be socialist. And what was more important was because of the history of socialism. You know, people don't pay enough much attention to the history of socialism in schools. I started doing a lot of research, even on my own family background. And, I, and apparently, believe it or not, my own great uncle, he was very much in the left, um, very much socialist leaning, um, self-proclaimed, uh, much more than that, I'd say, fighting in the war of Irish independence. And so what he did and what he set out to fight for was something that gave me hope and, uh, you know, and a way forward. And I think looking at role models like that is very important for all of us. And what we have set out to do to deliver a fairer society, particularly for the trade unions and also the British Labour Party as well. So that's how I identify with socialism. And that's what I actually believe in, Paul. Wow, that's uh, quite, a, quite a big story, that as well. Um, you, you mentioned there that you, you were di diagnosed with autism and people said it was recoverable and things that. You know, what was what was that like? I suppose as as um, as a young person, um, were you were you diagnosed at a young age with autism? I was diagnosed at the age of four, and I was told I was not fit for mainstream society or normal education in those days. Uh, the authorities tried to take me away, uh, put me in the most appalling what they call special schools, which were really dreadful in those days. And my family had to battle to get me into mainstream education or normal education, as they called it in those days. So it was a massive challenge, having to learn, having to be educated, but also having to socialize as well was a big problem. That was a massive challenge too, something I had to learn. 
and acquire. And I had to keep my autism a secret in those days. Couldn't tell everybody because that would go against you. That was the type of prejudice society one was living in. So, you know, I have a lot of understanding with LGBT people who've had to not tell anybody about their sexual orientation. It's a similar prejudice that I had to deal with being autistic, not telling anybody. It's only not until 2013 that I actually came out in the open and publicly declared uh, at, uh, I think it was at John McDonald's Labour Representation Committee. He encouraged me to come out in the open about my autism because I went on a course and was one of the guest speakers. I had known him for years and I never told him I was autistic. All these trade union representatives who heard me speak on the TV on front of BBC Live at the TUC conference, they didn't know I was autistic. I never told them. I had to keep it quiet because it could have gone against me even in the trade union. I felt that way too. But I think I started to come out there from 2013, TUC Disabled Workers Conference 2014. And then finally I did it in home territory, my own PCS union conference in 2016. So. Wow, that, that must that's a, a really big thing for a bit, really big step for you to have taken there to to really stand up for other people who may be in your situation do you feel there might be quite do you think this might be quite a, um a common thing where people are you know not not admitting to being autistic do you think or have you any idea on that um, I do have some idea. I've actually even represented members who refuse to disclose their disability, never mind their autism, well, not just their autism. So there is still that stigma that people feel. And I have to be honest with you, uh, Paul. I mean, having to say that I'm autistic and then stare at the entire audience, that was the biggest challenge. Speaking on the rostrum and facing criticism all the time was one thing. That was something I could challenge then. But to tell everybody I was autistic, that was the biggest fear factor of all. I think that was the most courageous thing I ever did publicly, was to declare that I was autistic uh, and still having to come to terms with myself and what people out there in the outside would actually perceive or think of me because I have to build up this image that I'm part of them. And then all of a sudden, when you tell them you're autistic, the opinions can vary and change automatically. It's it's great to get this kind of insight into someone else's experience because without that we, we couldn't possibly know what you've been through. But um, hearing these things, it's it's incredible, and it just goes to show how important solidarity is and showing yeah. one another solidarity and and socialism. Is that something you feel that you got? Did you get a lot of solidarity in the trade union movement? I certainly did. Um, you know, it helped me out self-confidence, it helped me out socialising. I found a home in socialism, I found a home amongst the left-wing uh, movements in PCS, with what we called left unity, not to be confused with the party, that was around a long time, um, had many different names, but that was an organisation I became very committed to in PCS and trying to build socialism amongst the trade union reps, but also amongst the members to fight for better pay terms and conditions, which you still have to do to this very, very day, I'm afraid. So it's a big, hard fight, but I think solidarity and the fact that we can fight together is so important. And I also wanted to say is we use the term community a lot for certain sections of society. But I will be honest with you, Paul, and I say I believe in one community, the human race. I mean, I suppose it goes back to communism, one community or the commune. But I think we, the human race, uh, are a commune, in our, well, in our own right, but we are one community, really. And yeah, I'm with, fighting to be part of that community with the discrimination I've suffered like everybody else. Nobody's going to deny that human right to be part of that community. Yeah, and within that community, there are so many there are so many diversities, aren't there? And you're right, there is yeah. um, one, one human race, and that is a scientific fact as well, that there is one race of people. And uh, the, race, the racism that we see in, uh, in society is actually constructed by human beings themselves rather than yeah. any scientific basis. And, uh, you know, in a, uh, it's lovely that I think I feel that myself as well with socialism it's something we can all unite behind and everyone would be welcome if they thought of val values of fairness and equality and solidarity and all those things um you mentioned about your your job um was that the so when when you were under pressure and you may have been losing your job was that a, was that a, a defining moment in your socialism did you feel that you were a socialist before that point 
Um, that's a very interesting point indeed. I was very much the quiet sort of person, uh, you know, who wanted to keep oneself to oneself, I think, you know, and it's, it's difficult to respond to that. But I mean, I, I was actually educated on socialism, you know, even doing an A-level in politics and I understood what it meant in communism. But also the fact is, as soon as I got more involved in the trade union movement and uh, working in the public sector, I began to un practically understand it far more and how we would relate to each other and how we would put it into practice as well. And to try and keep it basic and make it understanding for all of us. Um, now, can you go into, a, do you mind going into a little bit more detail about what happened in the, why were they saying that you weren't uh, fit to work in your job, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, what it was, um, I was a bit slower than others to learn. My mind operated on a mechanical basis. So it's like with autistic people, they actually try and memorize things to use the expression parrot fashion. Um, but it's what we call the mechanical way of learning. It's not like everybody else is an artificial way of learning. So, you know, they just learn things quickly off the top of their head. Whereas I had to be a one track mind focus, learn one area of subject, memorize that completely, know that perfectly. And then another section of the subject and memorize that completely. And this would take a period of time. And so I was quite slow to uh, master the job that I was set to do in the administrative work in the civil service at that time. And um, that was what was against me. And in those days, we're talking 1991, we didn't have reasonable adjustments because the Disability Discrimination Act didn't become law until 1995. And even then it was still in very primitive fashion. You know, uh, as for autistic people, that's interesting. It wasn't until the year 2004 that an autistic, pers autistic person's dismissal from a job was declared unlawful by the Hewitt versus Motorola case in which the Disability Rights Commission took this case on. This person couldn't represent himself, um, Hewitt. They brought in one of the top Queen's councils to represent this person, went to an employment tribunal. The tribunal found that the employer acknowledged that he couldn't socially get on with people, socially understand, but they, they certainly accepted the employer's view that uh, he, that one couldn't do the job. The, the Queen's Council went much further, took it to an appeal, and then the, the, the Employment Appeal Tribunal had found that the employer was both wrong uh, to sack him for, perform, for person performance, for person for the inability to get on with others. Um, because if the person couldn't get on with others, how was that person supposed to learn the job? But, you know, this has taken a very long time, Paul. So uh, it's really... Well, it's been a very misfortunate era, that's all I can say in that respect. But I think it's important to look to the future and not look to the past. Um, with regards, um, so did, at that point, did you did you get more involved with the trade union movement yourself following um, your own personal case? Did you? Did you, um, you... I certainly started to pick up, uh, particularly health and safety. Well, when I was out of work for a while, because I did appeal against, but I was still out of work for some period of time, I was looking for a temporary job and I actually worked in a corporate health and safety unit. And one of the first things I did on a site visit, we actually visit um, a tower block, a council estate, with health and safety inspectors. And sadly, they don't exist in the council anymore. And if we still had them today, uh, the fire in Brentford wouldn't have occurred. Uh, that's really important, how they did the job properly. And uh, when I went back to, when I was re-employed in the civil service, I then took up health and safety with a passion as a PCS rep. But then later on, I also started to, um, people that asked me to join that unity, which I did. And also I started to take on more personal cases as well, representing members. And it, I think it was the personal case experience. Sadly, I was to go through that all over again myself in 2004 and a year and a half of bullying. Um, and then they left me alone when I declared I was autistic. But back in 1991, if you told someone you were autistic then, you would have been one would have been prone to dismissal. Uh, it's it's really good to have like a, someone who's gone through these experiences, um, able to represent other people and using your experiences in a really positive way rather than thinking actually you know looking after yourself you've started to look and think how can i help others and how can i uh, support one another is that something that you feel that is important um no i think it's very important i think it's how we can improve society because what we're witnessing today is is dreadful with austerity 
poverty, uh, the rise of unemployment. Um, I've now just read a recent fact. I think it was um, back in 2010, it was 1,000 people on food banks. And apparently that figure has now increased 100 fold by today's standards, which is really frightening. And I think that's important that we take a view that we've got to start helping each other more because in Thatcher's era, it was different. It was every person out for oneself. Well, every man for himself in those days was a male dominated era under all the prime minister. Um, but that was how dreadful, materialistic, ruthless. And if you were seen as a member of the public sector, an employee was a view into socialism, one was seen as a loser. Uh, now, I think today we've got to change that mentality because Thatcherism, what it did, it didn't create a better society. It didn't create uh, a, few, a golden future for young people at all. Uh, it's actually created the very opposite today. And it's only through socialism that young people can have a future. If we have a socialist government, a socialist environment, we have um, you know, a socialist run economy. I think um, that's very, um, how we go forward for the younger generation if they want a better lifestyle uh, for the many, not the few. Um, I've seen you've been involved in a, a number of campaigns and you always seem very active. Um, I see you on Facebook and you're always like uh, involved in, in, in a, a huge variety of different campaigns. You always seem active. Um, what, what sort of campaigns have you been involved with through um, the PCS? And also actually in a little while, I'll come to your other roles as well, because you, you have a number of trade union roles, don't you? And a number of uh, different positions throughout our entire movement. Is that right? Uh, yes, I, I'm, that's correct. I'm on the Group Executive Committee in Ministry of Justice. Uh, I'm also branch organiser in my own branch, which is the Ministry of Justice Associated Officers branch. Uh, I was on the National Executive Committee for two years. I was voted off. That's democracy for you. Happens to us all. I'm now restanding, so I'm waiting for next week's result to see if I might be back on the National Executive Committee or not. But um, that's the way it is. As long as um, I'm, I'll keep up the work that I'm doing uh, in my own trade union, so it won't impact whatever the result will be. But uh, yes, I've been doing a lot of work. Uh, spoken at conference many a time. I have moved a number of motions as well. Um, I must admit that I actually moved a motion to ensure that the PCS union had a, a policy on defending comprehensive education at the time when uh, Tony Blair brought the academies in. When Tony Blair and David Cameron, two public ex-public schoolboys, regardless of their parties, did a deal, a cross-party deal, which annoyed John Prescott, even Neil Kinnock, uh, to uh, bring in academies. And so what I did was, this is outrageous. This is discriminatory against the working poor. This is the most dreadful form of class discrimination. Um, I didn't go to comprehensive school. I, you know, I was brought up differently. But I'm saying I went out um, and decided to move this motion, which I did. And we made sure that the Civil Service Union had a, a policy on this. I did achieve a lot of other policies as well, um, which I could go into a lot more detail. Um, and no doubt you can ask me questions later on, Paul. Maybe there might be a few controversies. We'll see what the audience thinks. I look forward to some controversies. I'd be interested as well, like um, what, what we're seeing now in academies and, and through my trade union, NASUWT, our big campaign at the moment and our current president, Phil Kemp, who's a friend of mine, he's, um, he is very much um, going after the fat cat bosses, he calls them. And in, in academies, what we're seeing is uh, your prediction coming true where the private sector is basically more and more involved. And we've got some CEO, CEOs, um, why, why a school needs a CEO? Because they also have a head teacher in a traditional way. And some of them are on 400, 450,000 pounds a year. And so others are like, there's a, a, it's standard for them to be on quarter of a million pounds a year and then have a head teacher to run all the schools. And it's, uh, you know, your, your um, work on that, although, they still went with that policy. So important. So thank you for doing that. Um, you know, did you see that kind of thing coming? Is that what you had against the idea of academization? Oh, definitely, actually, Paul. You know, what I could see, I was seeing writing on the wall. I was terrified we would go back to Victorian times of the Fourth Second World War when there was no schooling for the poor. And there was a danger that if you started closing so many local authority controlled schools, uh, there wouldn't be school places for every child 
it would definitely discriminate against the poorest working class people, which is dreadful because, you know, middle class parents, they're motivated from an early age with their children. And they're ambitious for their children, but they can afford to be because they're earning money. Whereas the working poor are struggling financially. They're too busy struggling financially to even focus on their children's future education, which is absolutely terrible. So that was actually one factor in itself. What also makes my blood boil? Now, when I was a child, and if you went back to the 1970s, a lot of middle class families found uh, an easy way to dodge the system. What they would do is they, you know, they didn't want to keep spending too much money on private education fees. But if a one of their children could pass 11 plus, oh, this, this child won't cost me so much money. I can send that child to a grammar school, you know? So it was, that was an easy way out for them. But today it's even worse with academies because you don't have to pay for academies. So middle-class families can, don't have to pay their children's education at all. And they can just get them in an academy place and they're, and they're freeloading, which is an utter disgrace in my opinion. And also the fact is that we're not, we don't really have inclusive education. We should uh, reach out to the children of the working poor which is fundamentally important. Uh, we need to give everybody a chance. Uh, there are children who've come from nowhere, even single parent families, who've done very well and have got to the top, but they're very few. Why don't we give more children of that nature a chance? Absolutely, I really agree with that. Um, one thing as well about academies that very few people are really aware of is, um, I used to work in an academy in, uh, in Northumberland and one of their what their their CEO at the time wrote an article, um, co-wrote an article with I think five other head teachers, and their their way of getting better results, their conclusion to get better results was exclude low quality students. And what they meant by that was exclude the students that won't get good results. And we're seeing this, and I work in a special school at the moment. And what we're seeing is in the um in the pupil referral units, they are full of people who've been excluded because they aren't going to get good results for the school. Exclusions are up so much on when, uh, on when they, this wasn't an option before academies, when a, a school had to offer education to people. And uh, it's such a worrying um, development that people can just simply wash their hands of people because they aren't going to get very good results for the school. And I, th I think that's partly the results driven culture as well. Yeah. But um but I wonder how many people as well. I wonder how many people uh, with uh, so autistic people are, are caught in that situation where, um, where, you know, they might be considered because their special education needs aren't being met, low quality students who aren't going to do well. You know, it could be a, a real problem there. Well, it, it's a terrible stigma as soon as they're diagnosed with autism that actually goes against them. That's what I went through at the time when autism had a far stricter definition long before Asperger's syndrome was recognized. Today, we're broadening the definition and that does help. And that does remove a lot of prejudicial barriers uh, on autistic children. It was terrible in my day, how we were all stereotyped. But, you know, there's a lot of, I ended up in a special needs school, it was when I was the age of four, I was put in an autistic compound. This was um, in a mainstream school, or we used to call it a normal school in those days. Now, what happened was, one day it was uh, on a very hot sunny day we were at to sit in this compound for hours there was no air conditioning in those days either uh, we were suffocating so when my mother came to pick me up she said why are you doing this to all these children and the teaching staff in that autistic compound they actually said because it's the harvest festival today the parents of the normal children are here if they find out about this autistic compound they will take their children away from the school and that was the attitude in those days. Um, you're talking the early 70s. So just to give you an idea of how, well, how prejudiced it was then, although we are improving, how, how much are we improving in terms of grassroots, in, you know, on the, on the ground within grassroots? And sadly, we had many far-right organisations who think there are cures for autism. They're going to use speech cures, rogue scientists, and actually there's results in the deaths of autistic children as well. Um, so these are, are worrying times and especially with austerity and poverty growing uh there's going to be far more autistic children today neglected again um, and i will be honest the children who are in that special school um 
if they're still alive to this day, um, they probably would be drooling in, um, at least a few would be drooling in care homes, you know, wouldn't be able to talk or speak or communicate, which is very depressing. So I don't like to use the term that I'm a survivor, really. It's, 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 but, you know, I think it's important how we go forward in the future. And we have to tell the parents of those children who are autistic that there is hope for your children. And don't give up that hope. Don't give up that um, fight, and don't give up that struggle. That's a that's a wonderful message, and yeah. uh, really, really appreciate that. So, uh, thank you. And I wonder if that's going to. I hope that will give a lot of people some some hope to yeah. see how um, how successful you are in the trade union movement, and uh, you know how 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 hard you are fighting yeah. for those rights. So. Thank you for that incredible stuff. Now, I want to talk about these controversial things <laughs> that you brought up earlier on. Um, so what are these controversies within um, within uh, the, is it motions that you've brought for trade unions um, or? Yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to be honest, but I mean, you know, uh, I, I'll make it quite clear that I'm a well-meaning person and I believe I'm a human rights activist and I'll fight, and if I have to, you know, campaign for policies that controversial. It's all about courage and having to face that public eye as well. So there are controversies that I've had to deal with in the past. I mean, coming from an Irish family, of course, and growing up as autistic, and of course, the time of when there were so many Irish jokes, you know, that was terrible then because people said, we know why you're Irish. But I think how that has impacted on me and how I've looked forward, um, how to go forward. I've certainly done campaigns in trade union movements. I even had to face an audience once. Uh, sorry, I'm not naming any unions or what meetings I was at, but what I'm saying is quite clearly is when you, if you went back 10 or 15 years, I was putting motions like troops out of Northern Ireland, because that was very controversial for people who actually lived there. But it's having to respect and understand their views and how we go forward to achieve peace for everybody. I think that was important too. Uh, there was one, big controversial policy that I got involved in. That was through the Labour Representation Committee, which is chaired by John MacDonald. Um, a motion was put up. Now, the mover of the motion, um, he, in actual fact, couldn't make it that day. He um, had to go to his son's graduation. But he asked me if I could speak on it, and it was nearly going to fall, which I did. It was seeking justice for the Craig Avenue 2, which is Paul, um, John Paul Wotton and Brendan McConville who'd been wrongly convicted, just like the Guildford Four in the Birmingham Six. They were convicted by a diplomat cause uh, for the unfortunate um, killing of um, the policeman. Very unfortunate, uh, very tragic for his family, the policeman's family, but also the fact is that these two, uh, it's true, they were falsely convicted by a diplomat cause without a jury. The, the evidence was so remote that even a trial by jury wouldn't have convicted them. They're now nearly spending, I think, 15 years in prison uh, what I did was through the Labour Representation Committee, I was very brave and very bold to get a parliamentary lobby meeting. It took me four years to find a backbench MP because John MacDonald was on the front benches. And then finally, I did find an MP. It was after two attempts, actually, believe it or not. Um, his name was Chris Williamson, he chaired it. But what happened was TDs came over from the Irish Republic, uh, four of them from the left, independent left parties, Claire Daly, I'm trying to remember, Thomas Pringle, um, sorry, Maureen O'Sullivan. Um, also, there was Eamon O'Quiv. Um, he was also from Fina Fall. He was the, he's the grandson of Eamon de Valera. So uh, he came as well to this, meet, um, this parliamentary lobby meeting. I mean, that was a massive achievement in itself, that what I tried to do was to try and seek justice and to promote this campaign because nobody really was brave enough, I feel, to do this, to get a parliamentary lobby meeting. But I think what's important as well, how I've felt the thanks and the gratitude that I got from the friends and the families uh, of these two very unfortunate people, and, sorry, John McConville, sorry, Paul, John Paul Wotton and, and uh, Brendan McConville. You know, in a way, I felt like I was almost feeling my great uncle's pleasure, who had fought in the War of Independence at that time, uh, and he was fighting for a socialist united island then. Um, that was nearly 100 years ago. But I think these are areas of controversies that I focused on, and not even Amnesty International wants to actually campaign uh, for the Craig Evans who or for the other prisoners who may have been interned 
in McCabry Prison, you know, just outside Belfast. So this is an element of controversy, no doubt. But, you know, as I'm saying, it's about seeking justice and what is right for society. And it's not about infringing on other people's rights at all. I think that's an important issue to discuss and debate. I think you've made it quite clear as well the respect that you had for the for the family of, of yeah. the victim there, but also you know you, you're describing those people who have been wrongly convicted and people shouldn't stand by. So, and mm. uh, it does take a lot of bravery sometimes to to stand up and uh, challenge these um, these uh, yeah. miscarriages of justice. And um, so, what what campaigns are you involved with at the moment? Do you have anything going on at the moment within either PC, uh, without PCS or or anywhere else? Well, um, I've just come out of the Hertfordshire Trades Council. Well, there's actually Watfordshire Trades Council, which is part of Hertfordshire Trades Council. I've just come out of a meeting just now, and uh, we've had a motion carried successfully on um, the campaign for COP26, the conference that we're pushing for in Glasgow in November. But also, I think what was important to the trade unions locally is how we can engage with agricultural workers fighting for their rights, which is appalling in Britain, very sad, I'm sorry to say. And at a time when there's so much food wastage and the damage that climate change is doing to agriculture. Uh, so that's something I've just been campaigning on right now before I came on to this uh, show with you. Um, what are the issues for the agricultural workers at the moment? Um, is appalling. Uh, was it back in 2010 when the government inflicted the bonfire of the Quangos and they wanted to get rid of all these non-departmental public bodies? The Agricultural Wages Board was actually one of them, uh, regulating the wages of farm workers, which is appalling. And so what's happened is United has worked very hard to unionise them. But now with Brexit, it's going to get worse. There'll be more exploitation by many of the farm landowners as well. So it's important to reach out to the agricultural workers. And I can proudly say that I am son of agricultural working class myself. Um, my family, father's family were farmers and my mother, uh, she was uh, agricultural working class. She uh, from Ireland as well, both of them. So um, that's another campaign I think needs to fight for in Britain. We can certainly remember those agricultural workers back in the days of Thomas Hardy and uh, let's, let's bring them back into trade unions, as I say. Let's give them rights and let's fight for their rights and uh, let them have, you know, a big say in, the, in our future uh, during the terrible times of Brexit. It's, it's interesting you mentioned Brexit as well. Has that affected these um, agricultural workers and is this making things more difficult? Because I know there's, yeah. there's been some sort of uh, immigration issues and some people simply not wanting to come to do the work that has traditionally been done, like the fruit picking and stuff. Is that all part of this? Oh, very much so, because they're actually recruiting, employing more uh, migrant workers, but even worse, they're employing students to just to do uh, hobby work or on low wages as well. And that's putting agricultural workers out of a job. And people who are suffering very much in the countryside are travellers, by the way, who've been doing agricultural work. So on top of all the brutal discriminations, they've suffered like Dell Farm, You've seen it on Fat Gypsy Wedding, the discrimination that travellers face as well. Uh, evictions, uh, prosecuted for trespassing. Uh, they're also suffering economically too. So, and I've been fighting for travellers' rights in my own trade union, by the way, BCS. You know, it's it's funny this awesome because you've got like such a, a wide ranging like campaigns. I think with me, with me uh, being in a teaching union, I'm always campaigning on education alone. But so far, you've mentioned, um, you know. Uh, miscarriages of justice you've mentioned education you've mentioned agriculture you seem to like um, be so involved in so many things is this is this the way things work in PCS or are you uh, a, a little bit um, you know are, are you an unusual case in that respect that you have such an eclectic mix of interests and you know and, and so many passions well it's a great interest but I think what was so great about trade union uh, PCS union it has always been traditionally a union of lay activists. And uh, we have lay activists in our trade union who really are committed in what they do, who uh, you know, campaign and fight for the passion. And so as PCS union, we have been involved in quite a, a, so many campaigns ourselves. I mean, some campaigns, of course, I have to do outside PCS union. It's in respect of conference policy motions as well. 
and what our policies are. But I think, you know, building those links uh, with PCS and, uh, and linking with other trade unions and what all those trade unions can do for the future, I think is so fundamentally important. And I will say that I'm very proud of my trade union PCS, what they've done for me and what I can do for PCS in return. Would you say that um, PCS is largely a socialist union, is it, uh, or is it a union with a lot of socialists in it? Um, well, uh, to be honest with you, it's a union with a lot of socialists in it because we represent all different types of members, and there are lots of members who may well agree with us. But I think the importance is that as long as we're representing them, then we're doing our job. So what would you say to someone who maybe isn't in a trade union at the moment? What are the benefits of being in a trade union? Um, there are enormous benefits in a trade union. Well, take, for instance, workers, uh, construction workers. Uh, many of them are not unionised at all. They should join the union. I mean, if they suffered an injury on the building site, they could go to their trade union lawyers and take out personal injury claims against employers. That's a benefit. That's something to spread to many construction workers who've suffered blacklisting, I'm sorry to say. Um, also, the issue is about representation, um, the right to be represented, to have fair justice at work. And sadly, to use the term criminals, they have more representation than employees. Um, someone's arrested by the police tomorrow and they're automatically entitled to a duty solicitor. Now, um, someone in work, employer doesn't have to tell you that you're entitled to a trade union representative. If the employer is not, hasn't had a recognised trade union, um, it's not their problem. They say you can bring a representative in, but they won't tell you that you need to, you're entitled to bring a trade union representative in. Of course, in the policy um, and the civil service, where we do have a recognised trade union, we actually, they actually put down, you I can either bring in a welfare officer for support or a trade union representative to represent you. But you can't bring in both you have to choose either one so it's almost a bit like Hobson's choice but I think it's important that you know there are huge benefits of joining a trade union and what a trade union can do for you and that as a trade union representative I'm not boasting by the way I have saved many jobs I saved two people from being sacked in one day and believe it or not I actually saved a person from being sacked on Friday the 13th so I shunned superstition for six that's brilliant news and it's really good to hear of these like positive stories and these mm. these positive outcomes and i know like personally um sometimes it, it can actually be a, a life or death thing as a trade union representative yeah. and um i don't want to go into any details but i have been involved in cases where you know you are directly involved in in uh, life life or death situations where you can actually help people and, and it's an incredibly rewarding thing being able to to help people in that way would do you feel that the like, do you feel it's a rewarding thing um in actual fact if i've saved a member's job from dismissal it's a victory even if that member gets a final warning uh if it was a three-year final written warning for gross misconduct that means a one um if that person's got a warning for sick absence but they still got the job we still have to treat it as some sort of victory because what we have to do is go through every procedure. Uh, we have to go through every process and we have to slow the possibility of dismissal down uh, for management by following every procedure and giving that uh, employee a second chance. Uh, that's what's so important in the jobs that we do. So we can walk out of meetings out in this case or in that case. But I think it's understanding employment law, what we're up against. Because sadly, the employment laws, they really benefit the employers, not the employees. But I think when you're battling against all the odds and you're saving members' jobs, you have to see it as a victory, no matter what the, uh, even if management think they've won the, uh, the case and the employers won the case, really, it's about saving the, men, uh, the members' job is the most important thing of all. Um, it's interesting you talked about employment law there. Um, have you seen in the last few years um, employment law uh, getting worse um and i know certainly in our union we're finding employment tribunals are heavily weighted in the favor of the employer and if you win an employment tribunal like you mentioned earlier on um you must see you tend to need to have overwhelming evidence is that something you you're finding as well that's what we have to do yeah it all has to be on the balance of probabilities and we have to do a lot of work and we certainly have to read through all the previous cases to 
So unfortunately, you're absolutely correct. It has got worse because um, an employee would only have employment rights after 52 weeks originally. And then when the Con Liberal Democrat Coalition came to power, and by the way, this wasn't the Tories, this was actually Vince Cable, the business secretary of the Liberal Democrat. He actually extended the, uh, the law to two years. And so after two years, only then would you have, um, you know, employment rights. It used to be 52 weeks. He increased it to 104 weeks. So there you go. Uh, and that's coming from the Liberal Democrat Party. Yeah, isn't it a shame that uh, at one point people considered them to be a, a little bit to left of centre, didn't they? But then they had the coalition with the Tories and showed the true colours. Yeah, and that's why many of us are choosing to be socialist, so not liberal. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm going to move on now to um, what are your hopes for the future? So um, do you have any hopes for the future through either through the trade union movement through socialism or like a combination of the two because they are quite interlinked aren't they i suppose so um what are your hopes for the future um well that's an interesting one i think you've got to keep the fight no matter what because if you don't keep the fight then you're definitely going to lose mm -hmm. but if you do keep the fight then you know you've got a chance so i think an important way to look forward i mean we couldn't even believe that jeremy corbyn got on the ballot paper a few years ago that was absolutely incredible. We thought there was no hope. And then it just transformed the Labour Party completely. Sadly, since it's gone, things are going the other way. But I think what we do, it's the same old story. You've got to prove, you've got to put those victories to use. You know, it's like a team can score a try or score a goal and they can lead. Then the opposition fight you back. And uh, then you have to spend much of the match defending all the time. Now, that's what we, the Socialists and the Labour Party, are going to do. We had the upper hand and now we've put the opposition really in an aggressive mode. We have to spend a lot of the time uh, fortifying, maintaining and defending ourselves because that's the true test of character. That really is for socialists. So that's the way forward for all socialists within the Labour Party. And may I say, even socialists outside the Labour Party because we can do it in the trade unions too. Yeah, I think it was. Um, to didn't Tony Benn say that there's uh, there's no final defeat, there's no final victory? Um, was it Tony Benn who said that? I'm not sure. You could be more knowledgeable than myself, Paul, on that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I think, but um, I, I suppose it's right. Whoever said it, but I do, I do think it was Tony Benn. And um, you know, you do have to keep that fight going, don't you? You can't just give up yeah. and and think that you've. That you've lost because there is no final defeat i suppose and there is no final victory so uh mm. yeah i think he actually said toughen up at the end didn't he yeah he did. yeah yeah so um right so um within socialism then what would um to you what would a socialist world look like you know how would it look different from the world we live in today um, well, I've just given that some thought. The first thing you have to do, you're talking about a socialist world internationally. You're talking about fighting those multi-international companies. Um, we, talk, we talked about nationalisation in the past, but the days of protectionism is now gone. Uh, we're now in a world of liberalisation, neoliberalism. Neo um, and what we need to start thinking about is not nationalisation, but internationalisation. So all these multinational companies have got to be shared by all the countries and internationalised, in my personal opinion, given all the workers' rights and trade union rights and the right to even call international strikes, which have been attempted in the past, believe it or not, as well. So I think that's what we need to start looking at. Uh, that's the new fight we're up against today with multinational companies, because nation states are becoming increasingly irrelevant. So we've got to uh, unite with workers all over the world. That's one of the first things. And then we have to look about a ministry of peace, because there's too many wars. And these wars are not genuine wars like the Second World War or the Spanish Civil War, fighting against fascism. Nothing of the sort. These wars are more about capitalist greed, uh, exploiting of other countries, uh, and the damage that's been done to the Middle East is just incredible. Um, that's due to Anglo-American imperialism. That's something we also have to stand up in a socialist society. Um, we put the pressure on the United States of America to withdraw from Vietnam. It's time for us now to put the pressure on the United States to stop interfering in the Middle East, to stop uh, destroying that area of the world, the cradle of civilization, 
the cradle of Christianity, the cradle of Islam, the cradle of Judaism, uh, and also as we move on in further times, you know, the cradle of many other beliefs, possibly too, as we go further. But I think we do need to campaign on that one, and we need to have peace, uh, human rights for everybody all over the world, and for everybody to have to have the right to live in perpetual harmony with each other, because it's only the minority rulers at the top who are really causing the hatred and causing divide and conquer, uh, which happened in Ireland very badly 100 years ago, um, partition. And now what we have to try and do is how are we going to go forward in the future, a better future for our children, our grandchildren. Wow, you've, you, again, you've got so many different, like you bring in so many things together and it's making perfect sense. The idea that like, you know, the, the massive corporations and the massive corporate greed and so on. And then um, recently I've, uh, I read a book called the Jakarta method and it was all about like when they were going to nationalize the oil industry, you know, um, the, uh, the, basically the, the USA took revenge and, and armed the people and told them to get rid of the communists there. And it seems to be, um, it, it seems to have been a long running theme that people, do you think people are seeing these things or do you think that people are just too busy in their own lives to actually notice what is, what has been going on? You know, that, and I know that's a challenging question, but it just seems to me that people don't seem to understand what is actually happening around them. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both, actually, Paul. There are people who are very busy with their day jobs and don't have time to, you know, they want to relax in their spare time. So any tabloid newspaper will do. And the sad reality is they see everything from a very distorted version, which is quite dreadful. And the type of reported news is also varied from one country to another. Um, I regret to say we know a lot what goes on in the United States of America. That's thousands of miles away from us. And yet we know very little about what goes on in Ireland today, you know. Uh, I'm up to date with it all, and that's only just across the, uh, it's the, Irish, it's the Irish Sea, not that far away. So, you know, we have been informed of a lot of distorted facts, I'm sorry to say. Now, one thing that people didn't really know in Britain was disability laws in the Republic of Ireland, which are not they're doing a, a lot, great deal for disabled people in that country. And that prompted me to call um, the first historic meeting of its kind yesterday, uh, the TUC Disabled Workers Committee, which I'm a member of. Uh, we had our first historic meeting with the Disabled Workers Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions because of the low employment rate in Northern Ireland, disabled people, lower than the rest the United Kingdom, but also the appalling legislation and laws and um, for disabled people in the Irish Republic. So we had an introductory meeting and I prompted, um, you know, I proposed that at the TUC Disabled Workers Committee. They thought it was a great idea and we went forward. So, yeah. It's true, it's about understanding what's going on around you and how you have to be politicised, but what you also have to aim for. And that's not easy, you know, um, what we set out to achieve or what we want to strive for, but you're absolutely correct. People are too distracted in their day jobs. Uh, also, people have personal circumstances and uh, there is a different way of how people will see things. It can be in very distorted fashion because of their personal circumstances and also the distraction in their day jobs and being fed the wrong information uh, by um, establishments of each country, which varies. Yeah, I find it really interesting that you brought up um, people's knowledge of Ireland as well, because mm. I think that's been a very frustrating thing over the past few years when um, the situation in Ireland is brought up by people who simply don't seem to understand it. And um, mm. we've had um, Tory successive Tory ministers for Brexit or for, for Northern Ireland who had never read the Good Friday agreement, agreement, which is, I believe it's 36 pages long. And I've read it, I can't remember exactly, but it, it's in the 30s. And you just think, how can someone be so negligent in their job as to not read a short, a relatively short document? You know, it is not a difficult read. Um, is, do you find that situation like as frustrating as I do? I, <laughs> I must confess, I haven't read the Good Friday Agreements either, but um, I have That's done not some your job. Re <laughs> no, but I have done some research, which is interesting, because they um, they have two, they have the North South Ministerial Council, and they have the British Irish Council, or the Council of the Isles. Now, the North South Ministerial Council has about twelve bodies, but as I checked, there isn't one body on equalities, so there isn't one body on race. They, yeah, they 
supporting marriages for LGBT, et cetera, and the Irish danger rights, they're top of the agenda. But they certainly haven't got an equality body for the North and South Ministerial Council, which would cover a whole range of other equalities, including disability. Um, that seems to be absent from the agenda from what I've noticed, and I brought that up yesterday, which did astonish, I think, people at the uh, Disabled, Disabled Workers' Committees. And also the fact is it's important now because, you know, it's nearly how many years now since the Good Friday Agreement? You're talking more than 20 years, uh, 22 years, I think that is now. But I think so much has changed since then, not a different generation. We're now witnessing, because of immigration, the rise of the far right both sides of the Irish border. So, again, um, this is where uh, it's becoming more dated as well when you look at these and how you look into the detail. So that's just one of many examples, by the way, Paul. I could talk on about socialism, so uh, a variety of other topics. Please. Uh, so um, what else would you like to say about socialism? So we've got like about 10 minutes left. What would you like to say about socialism? No, I think one thing very important here, and this particularly is in Britain, I will have to say this, that Britain is probably one of the most class prejudiced nations in the world. It, uh, to me, that's how I see it as a dreadful country that judges people by accents, that judges people by social backgrounds, that judges people by what school they went to. Uh, but there are people, of course, sadly, even I know London, who won't go outside their region. You know, they might want to go to sunny Spain for a holiday. Why not go to a holiday around the whole of Britain, for instance, and start drinking in the pubs with people from the north and the Midlands and Scotland, which is what I do, the Durham Minor Scala. I do that a lot. I, as a trade unionist, I travel around the whole of England. So I get to know, you know, the people of different cultures, the different backgrounds. But sadly, we are riddled with an outrageous class prejudice system here in Britain. And that's something we need to dismantle. I think that's a key element of socialism. That's something we need to achieve. I could talk about the aristocracy and the royal family, but maybe I'll save that debate for another time. I think what we need to concentrate on is the institutionalization of our enormous class divisions. And we don't even have it in the Equality Act of 2010, which is absolutely outrageous. Um, I actually think I would be interested in the, the royal family side of it because I often think, how can we live in an equal society when someone is born better than somebody else? And I think that's fundamentally what we're saying by having yeah. a royal family. Um, would you tend to agree? I 100% agree. Um, I didn't want to get on my soapbox on that one, actually. It's <laughs> that's that's yeah. absolutely fine. Um, so have have you got uh, any any final words, any closing statements for people or anything else you want to discuss? Um, yeah, I think the final message, Paul, is how we build a socialism of the 21st century. Because so far, previously, we, under previous Labour governments, we've only looked at a socialism of the 20th century, which is quite different, which was very male dominated, white male dominated, particularly in the factories. You've only got to see the movie made in Dagenham where working class women had no rights at all. We want to change that in the 21st century that women do have equal rights to men, um, have as much rights, but also rights for LGBT and socialism, uh, Black Lives Matter, we've been campaigning very hard on that one. Other rights as well, rights of all different ethnicities and races and backgrounds and faiths, but also disability, because it's very bad for disabled people here in Britain. Um, statistics, you're over 53% uh, disabled people in England are in work. Uh, that's what I think is very low, appalling, and particularly lower in some of the deprived regions of England. Uh, Scotland, I found out, was in 2019 is behind Wales. So Scotland is just only, only over 46% employment rate for disabled people. Wales is over 48%. And sadly, Northern Ireland is 37.8%. Uh, so, yeah, for the 21st century, we need a socialism now, not the, where we looked in previous generations where it was just for mankind and white mankind. Uh, we want a socialism that's for all people, um, men, women, people of different ethnicity, um, different colour to use the expression, uh, people of different backgrounds, and also disability and sexual orientation. Uh, these are very important factors that we have to aim for in a social society of the 21st century, and also free of the most outrageous class prejudice that we still have to undergo in Britain to this very day. And 
you know, this this is one of the important messages for, for us as socialist think tank. You know, that is not an outrageous thing to say, to want equality for people, to mm-hmm. want, you know, fairness for people and, and justice for people. And I think that's the message that we always want to go out in, through socialist think tank, that, you know, people should be treated with respect. They should be valued. They should be treated equally. The, you know, well, certainly not, not everyone will need, has the exact same needs, so not necessarily entirely equally, but, you know, with fairness and with respect. Um, so I want to say uh, thank you so much, Austin, for, for coming on tonight. Cool. And uh, I'll... I'll um... We'll keep the red flag flagging here.